Bad Pack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind the scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Hard to Tell Podcast, episode 123, Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca, still, you know, mm-hmm. being safe through the pandemic, you know, as much as we can. Uh, we got the some friends. Uh, no, we're not calling it the pandy. No, we are not doing <laughs> that. We are not doing that. We got to be lighthearted in these times, I'm That's not lighthearted. It's calling just it wha- the pandy. It's just whack. It's not lighthearted. It's, it's whatever. I mean, uh, I... I won't accept whack. You can say it's stupid. I'll accept stupid. It's not whack. I don't it's think it's whack. Folks, it's whack. Mir- uh, Mirren found it funny in our group chat last night, so I don't know what, like... Yo, you what are, you assume that she was laughing with you about it, but she really was laughing yes. at you about it. That's really what's going on. That's what the emojis told me. Okay. All right. We I mean, got chemistry, yo. What are we, what are we doing? Like, anyway, I'm not I'm not with the short people's alliance. Um Anyway, we wrote, we got our friends. We got some friends here with us. Uh, two of my favorite people, sports journalists, Word. Naomi Gray, uh, the homie, and Erica Fernandez, who made her AccuWeather debut last week. Um, That's great. Because she was angry about the trash, and I loved it. I love I loved the energy she brought. Um, so they're here today because we all just recently, we literally were just minutes away from watching the Last Dance documentary, which a lot of us have been waiting a long time for on ESPN, um, focus on the last season of the Chicago Bulls, second three-peat in the late 90s, 97, 98 season. Um, watch the first two parts. So this is what we're going to talk about in this episode, the first two parts. First thing I got to do is ask everybody, um, spent two hours watching this, two hours of our lives during this coronavirus pandemic. What did everybody think about it? I thought it was pretty dope. I thought it was amazing. Likewise, I just, I mean, I felt like, Obviously, I'm way younger than a lot of people who lived through the whole Jordan era. So for me, it was just like... A Thanks, good, Naomi. Like, Thanks for I, making me feel old. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I was, I'd be hella smack by saying way. But <laughs> basically, when Jordan was in his prime, I was like three, four years old. Ooh, so I never got even more old. I whole, so I felt like in that moment, everybody kind of watching and pausing, I felt like I was able to see Jordan along with everybody else in, in that moment. So it felt very... Felt very good to watch. Yeah, I'm intrigued. Yeah. For, I'm intrigued for everybody here. I'm gonna have to see what Brian thought too, because everybody here is much younger than me. I, I live not that much. Erica, you're not that much younger than me, but I, I kind of saw Jordan at this height, and so <laughs> it's a very interesting perspective <laughs> as opposed to watching people who who didn't watch it. Brian, what did you what did you make of it? You were tweeting a lot through this as we as we saw. I was. Um, I was. It was what, an all time Twitter night. Uh, Twitter was actually, you know, everybody, every, anytime Twitter can, Twitter can gather and be in unison on something, it's a great night because that's usually never the case. But yeah. this Michael Jordan thing obviously is going to stop the world. So everybody pretty much watched it and the rating is going to be sick. I really was anticipating this for a lot of the same reasons that Naomi said, because I experienced Michael Jordan differently than people who have lived through it. Doesn't mean you don't go back and research and watch some of the old stuff and, you know, but it, you just receive, like we kind of said off mic before, you and I can agree that Illmatic is the best album ever made in hip hop history, but we're both going to receive it differently because I was born when it came out. You know, so I have to go back and appreciate it a different way. But with Michael Jordan in this documentary, like, I, we're obviously just getting started, so I'm really looking forward to when we get to the crux of what's really going on in the middle. But you know me, I'm a big Scottie Pippen guy, and I was glad that 
you know, he starts to get his flowers in episode two. And I was really excited about that because I think a lot of people, you know, have to respect what he's done. And I, because I think he's one of the more underrated players ever. On a recent podcast we did, I called him probably the best defensive player I've ever seen. And this was my brother's favorite player. So this is why I was kind of up on Scotty and Michael Jordan at a young age. So watching all of that and him going back and forth with Jerry Krause. And berating him in a way that a lot of us want to do to management sometimes. So I found <laughs> I found I found an identifiable quality in that as well. So like I part two leaves me wanting more. Like I feel like I could I could do three through ten right now, yeah. but I'm glad we get to wait so then we can separate these podcasts a little. Yeah, bit. yeah. I'm, no, I'm 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 also <laughs> glad. It it would be too much. Like I think just binge it all. Erica, what what did you what did you really like about this in, in, in everything that you saw? It's funny because what Brian was tweeting that I, a lot of people didn't know that he broke his foot. I was definitely one of them. I thought he fractured his foot. So when I'm sitting, mm. I'm watching it. I'm like, wait, what? So I was I was stuck in that moment. And then I loved how they stuck to the music era. Like they were playing. Yes. Yes. That was my, I really was like, oh, thank God they're not playing the new age stuff like that. Most of us here aren't too big of fans of. Except that would have been weird. Yeah, exactly. But it was. It was really great. I love how they edit it. Um, I love the intros. Like everyone's, of course, on um, what's his face. Dennis Rodman was like, "I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go." <laughs> he could get away with that. <laughs> yeah, he's a household name. But it was funny that they put him in. That they used the edit of him in a wedding dress. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I remember when he did that. That's crazy, crazy time. Was it? Was there anything in the episode that shocked for you? Because I was a little shocked at how hard Jordan. And Pippen both went at Jerry Krause. Like Jerry Krause, rest in peace to him, looks coming out of this like a just evil Jabba the Hutt character. Like nobody was messing with him. He people were just giving him, you know, everything spicy. It's just like I was surprised. Like when Jordan made that comment to him about, do you take that pill for your shortness or your weight loss? I was like, yo. <laughs> <laughs> damn. Right. With a rim for, yeah, I'm sorry, Lou, with a rim for you. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, damn. I, anything else that shocked anybody in, in, in watching this? Or was any shocking moments for you? It was pretty much what you expected. Um, I would say the salary part was definitely way shocking. And I like everyone uh. else who was his agent at the time. Um, but I think he still carries himself into the humble. It's funny because I was listening in on my fiance was playing NBA 2K, so there's like this story feature that they have. I don't know anything about Two Kids, so you guys would probably tell me more don't about it. Don't get Brian started on this. <laughs> uh. Don't get Brian started, please. Right? So Scotty was telling his his, um, his trajectory, like I went to the University of Central Arkansas. Yeah. So I'm like, well, I just heard that like 30 minutes ago. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, youngest of 12. I know that. I just heard it. <laughs> so it's crazy that he still carries himself in such a manner. But I think that there's a lesson to be learned here that it's not just about the Jordans of the world. You also have to focus on the Scottie Pippins that there's other people that elevate you to get to certain places in your life. We would love to hear you, Brian, except you have pulled out your yeah, microphone. Okay. This happens once every episode. I don't know why that be... Yo, he moves serious. too much. He moves like... too much. That's what happens. He just moves too much. Probably. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I'd be fidgety. Like, before, well, like, when I go to sleep, I toss and turn a lot before I actually go to bed. But basically, like, yeah, I know that doesn't shock you at all. No. But what I noticed was a lot of, you know, kind of what I expected, people learning certain things. But I was actually surprised at the number of people, like Erica sort of mentioned, that didn't know about Michael Jordan's broken foot. Now, I didn't know about that for a good portion of my life. I actually learned about this at some point in middle school, but I had just heard about it. And then I really learned about it because if you remember, Dex, because you probably had this game in NBA 2K11, it was very memorable because that was the game Michael Jordan came back. He was on the mm -hmm. cover because he hasn't been in a video game in a while so him signing up to agree to do that was such a big deal and at that point you get to play as michael jordan through all these career moments one of the moments was this celtics game so it was the first time because that made me go and watch it because i'd never seen it to that point and i'm what 15, 16 years old at that time so because the game come, came out in 2010 yeah so i'd be 16 so that was one thing you know scotty pippen being an equipment manager before becoming obviously one of the best players to ever okay. play that's something that i knew that a lot of people on my timeline were saying that they didn't really know about the stuff that i didn't really know about was what erica touched on and what you touched on dex is just the in-depth sort of what was going on inside 
i.e., you know, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen versus Jerry Krause, and especially yeah. Scottie Pippen versus Jerry Krause to the level at which it was, because I knew they were at odds. I had heard that stuff before, but in depth, like the Scottie Pippen berating him essentially, and kind of justifiably so. You know, given the state of his contract situation, like to put it in perspective, Scottie Pippen made more money from the Portland Trailblazers than he did the Chicago Bulls in his entire career. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. Now, you to, know, to, so. to be fair, to be not fair, I understand why Scotty signed the contract he did based on where he came from, how poor he grew up, all his family members. I understood why he probably in 91, this is three years after his contract, first contract, he's looking at this and saying, look. I got to get paid so I can help my family. I got 11 brothers and sisters. Like, I kind of get it. It was a bad deal. I wish he had bet on himself. But, you know, I understand why he took that money. Now, and Jerry, yeah. Kra- Jerry Krause just does not come across, and I, it's tough because he's dead. I know people don't want to speak ill, but he does not come across lovable in this. Um, he does come across, what I can say to you is what I remember at the time, I was 15 years old. I remember... There was all this talk about them breaking up the team, and then he said it was last season. A lot of people thought Krause was crazy. They thought they could at least win and go one more time and win another championship. I happen to believe they could have had they not broken up the team. So I think it's really interesting as we get through this and we see how it was and how everything unfolds, like what the mood was like around that team, you know, as they were trying to get that championship. We know they win it, but it's going to be really interesting to, to, to see as, as we go through this. So, you know, I, I I thought that was great. Naomi, was there anything that shocked you in the uh in, in this I episode? Think, I mean, the it probably is like not the most shocking thing, but like for them to go thirty and fifty two and then get the eighth seed in the playoff, <laughs> that was like when I saw that I was like, bruh, for real? Like the eighth <laughs> seed in the playoffs with that record? Yeah. And that that to me was like, wow, that's because I mean I never really looked at those numbers and stuff like that before until obviously this documentary. So just seeing that was kind of like a shock to me. I like that they did that because I like that they've gone back to some of Jordan's early careers and struggles because that's something I did. Yeah. I knew they got that A seed. I didn't, I never knew their record was that bad for one. I really yeah. did not. I did not know that. And I did not know about the minutes limit he was on when he, when Jordan came back from the broken foot, okay. that was fascinating how the coach wouldn't, you know, was told he couldn't play him because of the minutes minutes limit. John Paxson pretty much saved them for getting into the into the playoffs that year. So that was crazy to me. Um, yeah, it's crazy. There was load management before we kind of knew what load management was. Um, I joked about that on Twitter that the Bulls invented load management. Yeah, nobody was nobody was complaining then. So you know, I I, I find that interesting. Any other interesting takes from uh, anybody here here from this that you found was really good? I honestly liked hearing his whole family dynamic with his siblings and the whole rivalry mm. and just kind of the way his father pushed him. Yeah. That was, that was, I mean, it's also sad knowing that how his father passed his way. So just seeing that he was always trying to impress his father and, you know, make sure that he's doing right by his dad. And it just kind of puts everything into perspective. Yeah. yeah. No, it I, was. I would probably say, uh, yeah. I, and I would probably add uh, probably just two more things. One, Michael Jordan's mom for her age, yo, she like ain't no yeah, black she, ain't, ain't no black people surprised here. We ain't surprised. Yeah, now yeah. we ain't surprised. Yeah. But I didn't. But I didn't. But I thought she would be like you know. Nope. Not seventy eight. Nope. You know what I mean? So black I was, black I, don't black don't crack, man. Black don't crack. That yeah. That, that, go, that goes for our Latino brothers and sisters too. We be doing okay. We be doing fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean some. Some of us crack, but that's because of like drugs and shit. Um, what's it called? Like the other thing that I, <laughs> the other thing that I remember. Well, they didn't talk about it here, but obviously they mentioned Michael Jordan's kids. And Naomi, you just brought this up, so it just brought me back to. I remember being really young. I don't remember how old exactly, but I remember being really young, and there was a lot of hype about Michael Jordan's kids as high school players. So one of them, I don't know if it was Marcus or Jeffrey or both of them, perhaps. It could have been both. I remember they had games air on ESPN. Like, I remember this. I don't know what year it was, and I know one of them ended up walking on to, I think, Illinois. None of them obviously became professional basketball players to the level of Michael Jordan, but I found that interesting. I don't think it's something that they're going to touch on. It's probably not even necessary, to be honest. But that was weird because... yeah, that's something that I remember. I don't. I like. I like. I'd like to do some research and figure but that out. That was like. That, that was like in the early two thousands. That had to be like two thousand three, two thousand some five, sometime around that time. It wasn't. 
it wasn't anything around this time that they're focusing on. So. I feel like it might have been earlier than that. I felt like it might have been late '90s almost or no, early 2000s. I, I don't yeah. know. I'll, I'll, I'll check. Yeah, I'll would, check. That that <laughs> that will be interesting. Look now, I too, I did like part two a lot because I thought it shined a lot of light on Pippin that that even things I didn't know. I think I remember right. reading it that year. I remember, it, and you got to remember, it's a different world. So me as an NBA fan at 15, there's no NBA.com was like just starting. I think. And there's no yeah. Twitter, and you mm. don't have access to all these writers. So you're only getting yeah. stuff when you were watching like Ahmad Rashad or NBA Inside stuff, or di- that was the kind of way you were getting your news. So to get some of these insiders who were around the team that I find it very interesting, or people who had ties to the team, like Michael Wilbon, um, yeah. all these people who had ties to the team, I thought it was very interesting. I didn't know what Scotty's feelings. You look back at that, and like, damn, Scotty was pissed. And I understand right. why he was pissed. And Word. what I felt bad for him, you know, we, we've we talked a lot about this, all of us, about player empowerment. And he tried to hold out pretty much at the beginning of the season and not get surgery and the injury and all that stuff. And it could have hurt the team. It ended up working out. But he took a stand there, you know. And I think I look back and it's like, I know Jordan called him selfish in that moment. And I kind of was like, no, I don't think he's really selfish here. I think. I thought the same. Same exact way. Once I heard Jordan say that, I was like, not for nothing. I can understand why Jordan's saying he's selfish, but I'm just like, Scotty got the short end of the stick in the worst yeah. way possible. Yeah. Yeah. To say I'm never gonna put on a Bulls jersey again. I'm gonna hold. I'm gonna do me. I, I feel him. He was completely undervalued. Like yeah. super undervalued. Yeah. That's, that's something. That's, that's something I didn't know about. And on the court, like you can't tell me he didn't deserve more. You can't right. That. I, I wish. I don't know how you guys felt, and Erica, I ask you this: Were you disappointed when they had when Scotty had made that comment to the reporter, and then the next day at practice, or whatever, they go to Jordan and they ask him about, "Hey, did you hear what mm-hmm. Scotty said?" I kind of wish Jordan had stood up for him there and said, "Yo, this man needs to be paid. He should be, finish his career in a Chicago Bulls uniform." I, I kind of wish he had stood up for him there. How did you feel about that? I completely agree with what you're saying because I feel like. I kept going back to the quote that Jordan kept, um, that they had released a couple of weeks ago that I feel that a lot of people are after this documentary, y'all going to end up hating me. And I said, yeah, this is the start of it, but it's <laughs> still household name. You're still going to be respected in the league and whatever, all your achievements. But as a person, you better defend me a hundred percent. F the management. You're already, you hear him, you hear him cursing him out in the bus. You're not right. even going to step up. So that to me is, I don't know. That's, I understand that Jordan wasn't thrilled with Krause either because he didn't like these bringing yeah. back the team. But I thought it was, I job. thought, yeah. But I thought it was this moment where he could have stood up for Scotty, where nobody had really advocated for Scotty. And mm-hmm. I think one of the reporters said this. I and I think you guys heard this in there, and I'm glad they hit on this point. He arguably was for a good four or five year stretch the second best player in basketball, and he was making. Yeah. All- uh, what yep. was he? What was he? What was he even making a year? Was it just over like two or three? three million? Like three million a year, basically. Just under three million dollars a year, and he was like the second yeah. best player in basketball. Two of those years, without Jordan, ninety three, ninety four season, and most of the ninety four, ninety five season, he killed it. I think he was second in MVP in ninety three, ninety four when the Knicks went to the finals. He was amazing. So you could actually even argue when Pippen, the way he played when Jordan was out the league actually elevated his game even more and showed how he could sort of carry a team by himself. And this man still was, what, 122nd in the league in salary? Like, there were yeah. bum- there were, there were dudes who didn't play that well that got way more money than him throughout his career. Like, I could just name names. And it's crazy. It's true. Yeah. So, De- Dex, because you, you could probably speak to this more, but was a product of Michael Jordan's lack of, I guess, defense for Scottie Pippen in that situation that we're talking about. Was that a product of maybe the times being different? Because now people are, you know, more about doing their own thing. And in, in, in that regard, they're not really siding with management as much as they used to. You see what I'm saying? Like at that point in time is a little different. Is that product of that? I think it's a product of that, but I also think it's a product of, you have to look at it like this. And I think, um, all of us here as uh, minorities and some immigrant, uh, you know, par- products of immigrant, you know, parents, I think a lot of times we heard things which is like, yo, don't mess up the bag. Like, you got to get that bag and you got to hold on to it. And I think for a lot of, you yeah. know, young black guys or Latino guys or whatever coming into any league, 
they didn't want to mess up the bag for the family. And I think if you are from where Michael Jordan's from too, and you've ascended to this height where you've got all this money and an incredible amount of fame. I mean, at that time, this dude is like the second most famous person probably behind like Michael Jackson or somebody, right? Like you've got all this yeah. incredible fame and you're like, yo, I'm not trying to mess this up. And I kind of don't blame Michael Jordan for that to some degree because I think it would have been hard for any minority to have been in that position mm-hmm. at that time. Like I wish he had taken more of a stance, but he kind of was the right. first... Yeah. If you think about it, he's the first megastar minority athlete that anybody has seen reach to that level of globalization at the time. You saw how the people were on him in Paris. You guys, so you, yeah. you could see that. That's how much of a phenomenon he was. And no black person had ever been thrust into that, that spot. And I think it was a tough spot for him. Do I wish he could have done more? Yes. But I think the times, to get to your point, Brian, almost so didn't empower him to do it. It's my thing where I think whether it's athletes or journalists like us, social media and being able to control your own platform has allowed us to be more empowered. It's allowed us to speak against things that we think are wrong or, or not right. Um, and so we, we have grown it's up. Because, yeah, go ahead. It's interesting because I didn't really take, when Jordan said that, I didn't take that take as if he was kind of more so nervous about, I guess, upsetting somebody or speaking out against Vanja. I took it as the fact that you know Jordan has that I want to win no matter what my mentality. Even when he was talking about the whole thing with taking the nine pills with their weight one B, and he was saying it don't matter it matters how much the headache hurts or whatever. Like yeah. it's all about winning. So I felt like with Scotty doing that, he felt like you you was messing up the flow of us being successful. So I think that was his take on that because he even said it like right before that clip came, he was like Scotty was being selfish. So he's seen it. So I think that was just things brewing up. Like, yo, this man is sitting out. He's doing everything. Well, we, could be, we could be winning games right now. But instead, he's trying to make this all about him. So I think that's where that kind of stems from when he said that comment. At least that's how I received it. But I could see it as well. Like, you don't want to speak out. And also, when he said that comment, it was just the day after. So maybe he didn't process it. That's just me giving him the benefit of the doubt. But that's kind of how I received it. I seen it as like attention, um, attention-driven comment. And you feeling like, you know, Scotty's kind of being selfish and only think about himself but in the whole realm of it jordan not standing up for him was him being selfish as well and just only yeah. thinking about the team and thinking about yeah so. i think two great things point. i think i think it's a great point and i think two things can absolutely exist right like i think you know i think jordan definitely was focused on that team mindset but i also feel like it was easier for jordan to say that when he was making what at that time i think 30 million dollars a year you know hey, you, at, know the you know yeah so it's like Yo, it's easy to say that yeah. where Scotty's well overproducing on his contract and he's not getting paid the way he is. I understand Scotty's frustration. Look, the fun, the great thing about that now when we see leaves get stronger is ain't nobody in the world signing a contract like that ever again. Like that's not gonna happen. <laughs> and I'm happy. I'm happy that we're at a place where nobody's gotta sign the Scotty Pippen contract. Like I'm sad Scotty had to go through it for other people, but yeah, it's a example. yeah, but this is why you like the things like the rookies getting their extensions after four years yeah. and they can really cash in and don't, that's the contract that can really set them for life no matter what happens. Like, I'm happy for yeah, all yeah. that. But yeah, I think... And at least he got his money on the back end, too. He did. He ended up making uh, over nine figures for his career, so thankful for that, at least. I am intrigued, Naomi, about one thing that you said, too, with Jordan. And I don't remember if it was you or Erica that said it, but about how, you know, he said people are going to hate him at the end of this documentary. Um, oh, and, I, yeah. and I wonder how much of that is going to be because of things like this. I think it's going to be more because people are going to see how much of like a hard ass he was on his teammates at times. Word. Like you've heard a lot of people say it, but I think it is something to see it. Right. Like, and when we saw him um, in that one time at the beginning of the 97, 98 season, how you trying to tell the guys to pick it up when Pippen was out, you can see like the way he was sunning Ron Harper. I was like, yo, <laughs> Yo, Ron Harp, and the thing, you know what the funny thing was? In those clips, you could just see, like, everybody knew they couldn't say shit to Jordan. It's like what? Jordan said something, and they were like, yep, what you gonna say? It's funny that you're saying that, because as I'm watching that, it took me back to, unfortunately, when Kobe passed, because a lot of these stories were being told. So I'm just like, oh, my God, this was basically Jordan, Kobe. Obviously, we haven't heard too much about that with LeBron yet, but we might soon enough. But that's what I kept imagining, like Kobe telling people, come on, you got to put in the work. I'm going to take away your sneakers because you guys aren't working. <laughs> I'm kind of. I, I actually think that it's something that we need to see. We need to see that side of players more because it's easy for us to just think like, oh, these are the go team guys. They're all bro. They'll dap it up. Like we know the most successful teams are in practice, hating each other, cussing each other's out. Like 
I mean, I, I wasn't obviously a basketball player, but I was a cheerleader. And I remember how practices used to go down. And we out there, we'd be smiling and looking like we killing stuff together. But <laughs> when it's all said and done, when frustrations are high, like yeah. the most talented athletes are the ones who get frustrated the most, especially when their team is carrying them down. So uh-huh. I'm not going to be surprised. I'm hoping, I'm hoping I don't watch this and hate Jordan at the end of this. But I don't think I'm going to be surprised when I see him getting in people's asses. Like, I, I was looking at those tips and I was like, yo, like, that's real. That's what we need to see. We need to see the world. It's easy for us to have our own mind, uh, I mean, to have our own emotion and our own image of the way we think Jordan is. So when we see him like that, it's like, it removes him from what we're used to, especially us who, like I said, weren't able to watch him in, in that form during that time. Yeah, it's, it's definitely yeah. intriguing to see. I know one thought I had, you brought up Kobe, Erica. I, I, it really hit me at one point watching this, and I was like, damn, Kobe can't see this. Because I think he would have been, because he was such a Jordan fan, he would have been thrilled to have watched all of this collection of footage. He really would have appreciated it. Um, and it's kind of sad he didn't get to see it. Um, and other, David Stern, too, rest in peace. You know, yeah. he was he was huge behind pushing this, this to be done by NBA Entertainment. So for him not to be able to see it, you know, the fruits of it, too, is, is, is kind of sad. But it's really dope they've been able to share this with the world so far. Now, looking ahead, look for you guys, looking ahead to part two and three. I think, I mean, three and four, excuse me. I am really excited because this, Brian, I, Brian's going to love this because we all know Brian loves violence. When you see them go, those games, them going up against the Bad Boys Pistons. Now, I was really young watching that. So, <laughs> it's a little bit before I started really watching basketball. Like, my first memories of basketball really are 91. So that's when I really like understood the game and watched it. But when I watched the 88, 89, 90 stuff, guys, seeing that is like the physicality. Woo! Mm-hmm. And people don't like to talk about it, so that's important. So Ryan that's likes to talk great. about it. <laughs> yeah. Yo, apparently, apparently part three is going to be like, so we got obviously the Scottie Pippen introduction in depth in this episode. Apparently, part three is going to be the Dennis Rodman introduction, at least from what I heard on Scott Van Pelt's mm. show when they were just talking about it. And that's something that I'm excited for. That's going to be a Yes, because <laughs> I, I am here for Dennis Rodman getting six points, 30 rebounds, and just being <laughs> wild. Like, I am so here for that. And just, just obviously, we know about the dynamic, and there's going to be stuff that we know and how Dennis Rodman is and his do- his documentary came out not that long ago also so it got into some of this but there's going to be some stuff that we learn and you know to hear MJ talk about him because how often publicly does MJ we get didn't to talk hear about a lot Dennis about, Rodman yeah we didn't hear a lot about Dennis Rodman exactly. and I'm intrigued to see they're going to go beyond, they're going to go back to Dennis Rodman on those Pistons teams before they yeah, had traded yes. him uh, to the Spurs that's going to be really interesting and getting to that you know I'm excited to see my bad boy Pistons <laughs> If I have a favorite if I have a favorite 80s basketball team to go back and watch, it is just, you know, Isaiah Thomas and Rick Mahorn and Bill Lambeer and just fucking everybody up. Yeah. Of course you of course you, of course you would like that. Remember, remember, you gotta remember, Dex, when I was a sophomore, I led the league in technical fouls. You know what I'm saying? Like Is anybody is anybody on this podcast shocked about that? I'm not. <laughs> no, my sophomore year, I cleaned it up after. <laughs> except, except, and I told you, one day we're going to get a high school teammate of mine up here to tell you the things that I was saying in our pregame sort of uh, a huddle. What Be- you went to? I don't think I ever asked. You went to Mar- No, I went to Martin Luther. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't go to Grover Cleveland because my brother was like, you ain't going there. That shit is not safe. <laughs> Wow, I can all somebody somebody who listens to podcast wants to grow over Cleveland is like mad offended right now. They'll be all right though. <laughs> they, they, they'll be okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the physicality in parts three and four. I, I I didn't like they had to show they showed Pippen dunking over Ewing. I hate that dunk. It still hurts my soul. I, I, I feel a kind of way about it. I don't like it. Uh, uh, yeah, still yeah. makes me feel a kind of way. That's a whole that's a whole other story. So everybody's excited for for next week. Uh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, this is something that we needed. Like, I felt like this was really as dramatic as the start. I just felt like it was really God working to make sure that they got this. No, for real. Done during this time for everybody to be home. Everybody had the time to talk about it. Everybody to watch it at the same time. And it's like people who are making documentaries in the future need to take notes at the way this production quality of this. Yeah. Right? 
Like, right. it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And apparently, and apparently, according to um the dude who I told you about, like he was on Bill Simmons' show and he, you know, sort of saw this through. Apparently, the last few episodes aren't even done yet. They're still in production, no, I, and trying to yeah, trying to turn that. those around. So, yeah. which I mean, I don't think that surprises anybody here necessarily because you kind of know how this goes when you're pushing something up. I mean, it was a, it was a little bit of a pain in the ass to even get them to move it two months up because I mean, look, it's a documentary. Like you know what yeah. goes into that. You but know, yeah, I had no clue it was an affiliation with Netflix. So that to me was a little bit. I was like, what? So. Right. I yeah, so that. so after I get this back. Too. Yeah, so after it airs, I think after each of the first two parts air, it's up on Netflix. So I think like at midnight, it'll be up on Netflix, and you can go and watch it. So it's great, and I, it's great that it'll be up on Netflix for people, even younger generations, yeah. future generations, to come and see this. Like that, I'm always happy about that. Anytime people have access, I might to, rewatch both parts this week too. It's oh, possible. It's possible. I might do it too. I just, I, I just love it. I wish more people did things on different eras of teens from the NBA. So. And this is you got to remember. This is somebody who we've been touching. Touch, I grew up hating the Bulls. I hated the Bulls yeah. as a Knicks fan. I hated them. They crushed me. I respected Michael Jordan, but I hated the Bulls. I hated the Bulls. I hated Michael. I hated Scottie Pippen. I hated everything about that team. Like even when they played the you know the intro music they were playing. Dun, 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 dun. What? Yo, I was I was sitting there looking at my TV like, yo. <laughs> Ducks to return. <laughs> yo, I'm telling you, yo, one day we gotta get into a podcast about my Nick fan. I'm a crazy Nick fan. Yo, I was insane, okay? And I did not, I didn't like the music. I didn't like Benny the Bull. I didn't like the United Center. I didn't like none of that. You sound, you sound like DMX when he was talking about Drake. I don't like his face. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I talk about people. So I get it. Yeah. I, I, I don't like any of that. That's like the angriest you ever hear me on this podcast. It's, it's bringing back negative emotions. So. That, that's it. <laughs> All right, so everybody's looking. For, everybody's looking forward to next week. Uh, ladies, thank you for joining us to talk uh, about yes. this. I'm glad everybody enjoyed uh, part one and two. We'll be talking about more about this when we come back on a Hot Stuff podcast. New podcast alert: Life coaches Marguerite Pierce and Lindsay Jackson are bringing a rich blend of laughter, love and wisdom to their podcast necessity the pod seeks to re-establish the basic tenets of self-love self-confidence goal accomplishment and the ability to love life on your own terms necessity is available on all major podcast platforms so grab a cup and listen up as two coaches are on a mission to shift perspective one sip at a time All right, one time for your mind. A lot going on in the world. We will talk to you about it, bring you some good news. Uh, Brian, what you got this week for one time for your mind? <laughs> maybe some good news, but uh, maybe, shortly before maybe. We sometimes started, it's bad news. Yeah, yeah. Well, this we'll we'll classify this as interesting news. So I just saw this variety story a little bit right before we started recording this. Oh, okay. I know where this is going. The uh, the headline was very interesting. Alex Rodriguez, Jennifer Lopez retained JP Morgan to raise money for Mets bid. John Heyman then tweeted out that this is geared towards a potential stake in Mets ownership that they aspire to have. I don't know if they're going to just try to buy the Mets outright from the Wilpons, but J-Lo and uh, Alex Rodriguez are appearing to try to come up with something. Uh, I'm just going to read like a couple excerpts from this Variety story. The Wilpon family, uh, which owns the Mets, said in December that there were talks to sell up to 80% of the Major League Baseball team to hedge fund Titan Steve Cohen, which we actually talked about on this podcast, yep. and a deal that valued the club at $2.6 billion. Under the terms of that proposed be- uh, proposed deal, the Wilpons would have maintained control of the franchise for five more years, which met a lot of Met fans were um, not happy with. I but was fine with it. It was a way for them to get out. This article notes that their combined net worth, them being A-Rod and J-Lo, is about $700 million, which, as we know, is not enough to necessarily get you know a sports organization, which I think people have a hard time wrapping their heads around because... That is a lot of money, but then, you know, the 1% of the 1% is different than just the 1%. 
Um, but I don't know. Do you feel like there will be some eventual momentum here? Do you feel like they can potentially get a group together and do this? Because I really do think that, especially A-Rod, I could see where the ambition is. Yo, I want to own a team, especially in a league that he's had some ugly, ugly back and forths with publicly. So I'm I'm sure he wants a seat at the table in one way or another. I mean, I think A-Rod's revitalization of his career and his image. First of all, I've always liked A-Rod. I've always been an Alex Rodriguez fan. I do not condone the cheating he did, which he obviously has uh, apologized for. I still think he should be in the Hall of Fame. That's a whole nother thing. However, a couple things here. Any, any, I think most Mets fans would agree with me on this. Most Mets fans want to see anybody on the team beside the Wilpons. And I'm not even throwing shade at the Wilpons. I'm just saying I think the time has run their course. They want a ownership group that's going to put money into team, that's going to spend like a big market team. That's what they want to see. Number two important factor is the culture here, right? Which I'm really excited about. We can get a Latino owner. That is huge for the sport. Two. At two, two. Who's the other one? Oh, you're talking J- about with J-Lo. Being J-Lo, yeah, too. yeah. But... That's huge for the sport, which has a strong um, Latino representation in the sport. And to have a Latino owner, I think, would be tremendous in the sport. I want to see it happen. So I'm rooting for it in in, in multiple ways. We're starting to see more uh, Latino managers, more Hispanic managers, which is really good. But to have ownership there also would be really dope. And that's kind of really getting a seat at the table. So if I'm a Mets fan, as a Mets fan, yeah, let's get excited about it. Let's hope it happens. Even if A-Rod could get something where he can get in and maybe get 20% of the team or something like that, maybe work his way up to owning more ownership. Look, A-Rod getting any type of ownership as a Hispanic man um, is huge, is significant. And as a former baseball player, and I think you can use him a lot to attract a lot of other players, whether Hispanic or non-Hispanic, who are going to look up and they know A-Rod is a beast. So, nah, it's dope. Look, man. Ask again, ask Mets fans. They want the change. People were upset when another deal came through. Brian, you know they want the change. It's just, it, this is hope. It's hope, yeah. man. It's hope. Yeah, and I would I would like to see, obviously, I, you know, I would echo all the same stuff. I would like to see it happen for those reasons as well, even though, you know, some of my people have a weird relationship with both of those people that I just mentioned. But then again, I mean, you know, I mean, who, who, who's really universally liked? I feel like if A-Rod and J-Lo were to eventually pull this off down the line, however long it could be, then they would be in favor of a lot of Met fans at that point. And at the end of the day, that's probably what would matter the most in this case scenario. And again, anything but the Wilpons at this point, but I, I, I would like to see it. I mean, Look, if we have a shot at Hispanic ownership, that's probably the best shot right now, right? I don't, I can't really pinpoint to you where else. Like, is there somebody else on the horizon that I should really know about? Probably, but I, we don't know. So, look, I don't know. I'll take it. I'll be, it would be dope too if they could get get some other, you know, whether it's millionaires, multimillionaire Hispanics to get get on board. Let's 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 unite. Like, uh, yeah, you know, like I said, and and don't think it's insignificant, even if they have a minority ownership, it does mean something in yeah. in, in this case. Absolutely whatsoever. Um so my one time for your mind this week, I didn't really have a lot or anything shocking to choose from. I guess it's kind of shocking. Um for a lot of people, when the time you listen to this podcast, uh the announcement has already come. Um and I guess the way I'll title this and start this off is the South. You know, I'm thinking about the South right now. I just got to I gotta do a face palm. Like, I will say this, and our friends from the South and everything, the South, as I will say, is a very interesting part of this country. <laughs> Florida is an even more special place in this country for many reasons. Um, but the reason I say that is um, the Georgia governor, along with uh, other some states, have plans to reopen business. Now, Georgia is going to reopen their businesses as early as Friday. Uh, some other states have had uh, similar plans. Uh, Georgia Republican Governor Brian Kemp announced Monday that certain businesses can reopen this week in a move that breaks from the majority of state leaders and defies the warnings of many public health officials. Kemp said that specifically fitness centers, which I'm still looking at, like, who's going there? I even talked to my boys, a personal trainer, about that today. Like, who wants to go to the gym right now? No. Yeah. No. Bowling alleys, body art studios, barbers, no. No, come on, fam. Hair and nail salons, no. Like, a lot of women I've been talking to, they can't wait to get their hair or nail, nails done um, again, but nah. But look, Mas- if you're staying home, you don't need that done. <laughs> yeah. Massage therapy businesses, like, all the stuff where people are really close and touching you in proximity, 
These oh, those kind of businesses can open as early as this Friday, April twenty fourth. Uh, theaters and restaurants will be allowed to open on Monday, April 27th, while bars and nightclubs will remain closed for now. Now, here's the thing. This is what you're going to hear, Brian, from people who are saying, yeah, this is a good thing. It's not that crazy down here in certain parts of the South. Um, let's just take a look at Georgia. Georgia was hit its projected peak for daily deaths 13 days ago from the time we're recording this. That was April 7th. Okay. But that same model predicts that dozens of people will die each day in the coming week. And to limit a resurgence of the virus, the model said that Georgia shouldn't start relaxing social distancing until after June 15th, when the state can wow. begin considering... Yeah, total different in time <laughs> difference, right? When the state can begin considering other measures to contain the virus, such as contact tracing and isolation. Now, this is, I think, is a major problem. I also want to add the Republican governors of Tennessee... South Carolina on Monday signaled uh, similar phase reopenings. They didn't announce exactly when that's going to come. Also, over this past weekend, we saw Florida. I think that was in Jacksonville, actually. Special place, even within Florida. <laughs> as our friend Maria Fischilla will tell you, they announced they were going to reopen their beaches. I think a lot of this is um, too crazy and too soon. A lot of this is coming from Republican governors, where I think their base as we've seen lately in this country, is really fired up and is taking to the streets just because they're angry and they feel like nobody should ever tell them what to do. I yeah. don't agree with those people on that, but they're just really angry and I don't think what it is, they were going to grandstand on this and that's what they're going to do. However, I think these people are not caring about the people and I think it's a huge mistake when you're looking at the states where there maybe haven't been as many cases or the cities where there haven't been as many cases and think that that can't change really quickly. It can Really quickly. And I don't understand why people won't listen to the experts. Brian, you heard what I just read, that that model and the experts said that you should wait until after June 15th, right? When you can maybe start relaxing some of these social distancing. Why aren't y'all listening to the experts? Like, I don't understand that. Like, I'm annoyed by this. Um, I don't know what's going on in the South, but y'all need to wake up. And sadly, I think they're not going to wake up till maybe there's another wave of this. And more people start dying. And it's going to be sad that if they open up too early. Because the worst thing that's going to be, Brian, I'll let you say your thoughts on this. The worst thing that you can happen is you relax these social distancing laws. And a week from now, you start having a whole bunch of deaths. Not going to look good. But it won't be the worst thing in the world if it's those people that sort of abide by Republican leadership. Who really, really subscribe to that stuff. And the reason why I say that is not because they don't believe what we believe. And it's a left-right thing. But I'm right. saying, look... Some people just need to play with fire and get burned. Some people just need to go outside and just actually get this thing and really, really suffer for an extended period here's, of time to learn the seriousness of this, I guess. Here's my problem with that. I think I think everything should stay closed, obviously. But like, yo, if these people really just want to like just go outside and try to fuck it up for everybody else, whoever's going to be responsible should just be responsible, stay inside or whatever. But if these people want to put themselves out there, then I hope that they get sick. I here's, hope that a lot of them here's, get sick. Here's, here's the problem. Here's the problem with all that. You can wish that on those people and want that on those people. What happens when they get sick? You know where they're going to try to be? In the hospital. And you think it's, then they're yeah. going to be around those, those people that are on the front lines, the healthcare workers that are out there. And yeah. I'd be looking at them like, oh, y'all. Especially, and this goes to the people who are protesting. But they, should, but they shouldn't be cared for, to be honest. Like, I, I saw some people joking about this on Twitter that they were saying, like, hey, they should make them sign a form. <laughs> sign a form where, like, oh, if I'm out here putting my life on the line, that I can't be hospitalized if I get the coronavirus. I mean, I, I, and I'm like, yo, they should honestly sign that. They, like, it's, I'm, it's, not trying, it's, I'm not even trying I, to be I, funny. I understand what but you're I'm coming like, from. Yo, if, you don't, if you think this is still a hoax, if you think this is not legit, then go ahead and yeah, get go, it. Go, and then go, when you get it, just you know, go play, go play, luck. go play Russian roulette if you want to, and yeah. you you can go do that. But yeah, I know it sounds harsh to say I'm not, and I think just to be clear, Brian's not saying that we don't care about these people as people or the human lives. But I do think there's something. But evidently, they don't care about right. Workers. And I think there's something to be said if you're going out there showing that you don't care about people, that it's the ridiculousness to expect the same level of care if you get sick. I think yeah. that is ridiculous, and I do think it's fair to some degree to be like, well, y'all ain't acting like y'all care about people, so you can't act like when your life is on the line and you want people to care um, about you. Like, not 
cool at all whatsoever. And and like up here in New York, we're like we're starting to see things. We're starting to see the numbers drop. We the peak still a long way to go recently, and it, yeah, and that's what I'm saying. It's still a long way to go. We're not even close to even thinking about that. And I hope that nobody fucking flies up here from over there in Florida or Georgia and fucks it up because we're actually making some pretty decent progress. <laughs> and then they come over here and give us a second wave. Like that's what I don't want. I don't. I don't know. I don't know how this is gonna affect those other places. I'm just. I'm grateful that we're at least in an area where we're approaching this as best as we could with the governor who's responsible, with leadership here who's responsible. Like, I don't think any situation is perfect. Obviously, none of this is perfect for obvious reasons, but I'm just grateful that we we don't have uh, the governor from Georgia up here. Yeah, I, I, I am too. Because in a city like New York, that would be the worst thing you could do. Yeah, right? it would be. Like, but I, I, you know what? I, I am grateful that, and I think it's something to be grateful on. I, I will end with this, but what I saw, my cousin actually posted this on Facebook, and she had posted something that said it had like these cartoons and a split down the middle, and mm-hmm. on one on the left side there's a dude, and he's like, the curve is flattening, so we can stop social distancing, and then on the right side it's the same dude, and he's in a parachute, and it says. The parachute has slowed my fall, so I can take it off now. It's the same. It's, it's it's literally a great example of the same stupid logic that just because the curve is starting to flatten, that we can now ease up on what we're doing. As same same logic as, hey, well, if you're in a parachute and it's slowing your fall, so now you can just take it off. It doesn't mean you're not going to fall hard and crash. And just, I think it's just, a really good analogy. Like I understand. Like it's just you know, t- just typical American ignorance and everybody's just so like, you can't tell me what to do. You know, I don't care that the, they the want me to stay at home. And even, you know, 45 is obviously not helping because he wants to reopen everything yesterday. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like he wants yeah. everything to be just because e- they're concerned about the economy. They don't care about losing, you know, a small percentage of lives, even though that percentage is kind of growing a little bit incrementally. Um, it- It's just everything that's, it's, Again, this is just exposing everything that's sort of wrong with America that a lot of us kind of knew already, or at least had the idea like we I don't know already. About, I don't know about a but, lot of us, but but yeah. but oh, fair that some of us knew already or had some idea about that we're even learning more of now. So I mean, huh, whatever, man. I mean, like I, I, it's just you just throw your hands up and be like, look, I'm just glad I'm not over there. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, that's how I look at it. But I like, guess rough up here for obvious reasons. But we're Look, the, he, up here, what we're going to start to see in probably about a month from now are the results from what we're doing in social distancing and staying home in Hopefully. April. And the numbers are going to look a lot better. Not good, because there's still going to be people like lost and stuff like that, but it's going to look a lot better in May. And a lot. that's probably when you can get to the point where it's like, okay, maybe some point in June, maybe it's July, whenever it is, but then you could start theorizing what day is. But we're still so far removed from that. I don't know how places like Georgia and Florida are like, yeah, fuck it, open up beaches. Like, mean, you know great, what I mean? Great, great, great. Let's, let's open up barbershops so everyone can start touching each other again. Like, nah, bro. Like, I, I've had the same barber since I was eight years old. I ain't rushing to go back to him, but I yeah. hope he's doing well, uh, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to see him again when all this is over, not right. now. <laughs> right. Totally understand. Like, uh, I'll grow an afro if I have to. You know what I mean? I'm not, well, I'm not scared. I'm on my way there. All right. <laughs> That's it for this episode 122 of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. A uh, special thank you to our guest. Earlier in the program, Naomi Gray, Erica We're Fernandez for talking two of, two uh, of my with favorites. us about The Last Dance. We will try to recap and talk about The Last Dance after every uh, two parts are aired throughout this series. So for the next five weeks, we plan to do that. Uh, we have some other good stuff, some other great guests coming up uh, along the way. Um, we'll try to get some more uh, player A versus player B. We're going to do that or, again. And Brian and I have another series we're going to try to unleash in the next couple of weeks that I think you guys will find Really, really fun. All right, so that's it. You know what to do. You know how to find us, subscribe us, follow us on Twitter, Instagram. Subscribe to the podcast. Share it with a friend. Tell a friend. Share a clip. Tell Brian he doesn't need to be violent. Whatever it is you think that you need to do, that's what you can do. For Brian Fonseca, I'm Dexter Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace.